one of those days where I basically um, have nothing to do other than thank the company for actually trusting um, our group to actually run some of the translational science that actually validates theory and translate it into what can actually make to the clinic. And what I'm gonna be showing here today is probably about the most consistent database that I've ever generated in my life. And that is quite unusual whenever one is dealing with biological materials, tissues, and especially uh, large surgery. I am going to transition from what actually concerns craniofacial or maxillofacial surgery into uh, orthopedics and neurosurgery and show you how osteoidentification can actually uh, yield you know, interesting results, which hopefully down the line is going to benefit patients uh, all over the world. So before I even start, I'd like to acknowledge that I don't work alone. I do have probably the largest group in surgical uh, device research that ranges from dentistry all the way to neurosurgery and orthopedics, plastic surgery. I work um, at the Biomaterials and Biomimetics, which is primarily an engineering um, department within the medical center at NYU, and I also work at the Department of Plastic Surgery, pretty much where we do most of the surgery, and uh, hopefully some of the things that we are developing at NYU are going to major clinical trials soon enough. Uh, our group has the distinction and privilege of being funded by three of the most competitive uh, institutes at the National Institutes of Health, um, NIAMS, NICHD, and IDCR. We also have some extensive craniofacial and long bone reconstruction, reconstructive work through 3D printing and medical devices uh, with the Department of Defense. Uh, the laboratory is also, besides being funded by the government, it's heavily funded by dental, uh, craniofacial, and orthopedic private industry. I am a consultant to multiple companies in the medical device field, and because I consult for just about everybody, that means I have no conflict of interest. If you consult to one, you do have a conflict of interest. To two, you also have a conflict of interest. I consult for more than 20, so I don't have the privilege of actually having a conflict of interest. Um, and if you question any of the data that I'm going to be showing here today, the laboratory actually has an open door policy and the data generated is always available to all. So. Getting down to brass tags, interaction reversa. I was skeptical at first, but as a scientist that enjoyed chaos, and I'm gonna show you chaos in the very last study that I'm gonna present, uh, I didn't believe, but it did have some merit to it. Uh, and unfortunately, based on textbook science, you know, the technology presented by Versa should not work, despite the limited literature, which is, I am going to say, I have a good chunk on surgical instrumentation in dentistry, uh, for dental implant placement. Our literature in surgical instrumentation is pathetic, okay? It's scarce, contradictory, and basically we've been doing work based on textbook knowledge, all right? And in fact, according to popular belief, as I usually say, <clears throat> nothing other than moderate speed, irrigated, subtractive bone drilling, and incremental drilling should work. So very interesting concepts for us to actually start looking into you know, alternatives. Interaction started in 2014, multiple preclinical studies to evaluate clinical, biomechanical, and biological behavior of osteodensification. Currently we are at more than 10 preclinical studies and I'm not talking mice, rats, or rabbits. The animals that I'm going to be showing you here are as big as you are, and depending on how big you are, they're bigger than you are, okay? So we usually do translational science in highly translational animal models. I am going to show, as I said, dental and orthopedic and some neurosurgery related projects. Six large animal translational studies will be presented today. And basically I'm going to be doing nothing but relaying data as we collected it. Um, as I said, the most consistent results ever generated by our group regardless of implant system and bone um, model utilized. This is a delight for someone like me who actually at times have error bars that are not that friendly in statistical analysis. So when it comes to dental implantology or any implantable device in bone, basically we need to consider several things. Hardware, micro and instrumentation dimensions, microgeometry, which is a surface texture, 
nanogeometry, which is the texture within the surface texture, and then the ad hocs, as I call surface chemistry, physical chemical modifications, and biological alterations and factor. I, factors, I do have the largest experimental database available, and it is a fairly consistent database, and putting retrospectively 15 years of work, I know for a fact that what dictates initial healing and how fast that is going to go happens to be surgical hardware, which is the dimension of the implant, and how that interplays with your surgical instrumentation, not only the surgical instrumentation parameters, but also the diameter of your surgical instrumentation, how that relates to the uh, geometry of your implant. So by A plus B, if you come visit the lab, I can prove to you that this is the case. Case. That is what dictates healing. Now, surface texturing. You know, if well coupled with this guy here, yes, it is going to help. If nanogeometry is well coupled with microgeometry, this is going to help the cause as well. And then we have all the other stuff that in the end of the day is going to do nothing but changing genotype and phenotype, not genotype, but phenotype. And basically, you may have the best chemistry or biological molecule that has been synthesized to date. And the, if you don't have this actually together, this is going to be minimized despite being very effective depending on you know, just the surface itself. So surgical instrumentation and surgical hardware design is what dictates bone healing. Uh, and to no surprise, guess which parameter has been the least investigated in biomedical engineering, orthopedic, and uh, craniofacial surgery? Well, it happens to be surgical hardware, which is the implant geometry and the, um, and the surgical instrument, and the instrumentation as well, excuse me, guys. All right, so one of the things that I would like to highlight before we even start, I am going to talk a lot about bone implant contact during this presentation and bone area fraction occupancy. Bone implant contact is the percentage of bone that you have in contact with your implant surface. And the other one is a little bit less intuitive, which is bone area fraction occupied between threads. So in reality, you take the measurement of this area here, and basically you try to figure out how much bone is occupying these threads right there. So I am going to use this from now on, as if you have been familiar with this for quite a while. So before getting into osteodensification, I'm going to just breeze through some of the data and the literature that is out there, uh, just to for you to have an idea of how much we still don't know about this. Very simple study that we ran years ago, uh, 2008 if I'm not mistaken, published a journal of arm axillofacial surgery. Basically, we ran surgical instrumentation at 50 RPM, which is blasphemy, was blasphemy at the time, versus 900 RPM. And I remember sending this to the editor of the journal at the time, who was uh, somebody I uh, relate to a lot. I knew him relatively well know him relatively well, and he sent me, well, the paper is well designed, the results are unequivocal, so can you please expand on the introduction and literature review? And I replied to him, was like, what literature, right? Uh, if I went actually back to the orthopedic literature, that's not necessarily applicable because they do things completely different than uh, dent dentists would do. But anyways, just so you know how deficient the literature was at the time and still is, we have flushed the literature with plenty of studies in surgical instrumentation just to go ahead and basically prove wrong some of the textbook knowledge that we have. So lower drilling speed presented slightly better results uh, to no surprise, and we'll discuss that whenever you wish. Uh, low drilling speed, lower dieback distance. So if you decrease the speed of what you're doing, basically you're killing less bone. So bone dies back less, and technically it should be less time for you to actually close the gap between the bone and the implant. Now, that's when it started to get fun because we would upset a lot of reviewers over time um, based on our study designs. Uh, this is something that was funded by MIS uh, back in probably 2011, 2012. And basically, we had surgical drilling techniques all at 900 uh, RPM, everything irrigated, which is you know, what we think and presume we should be doing, all right? Um, and we used classic instrumentation, the 3.75 millimeters implant, 4.2 and 5 millimeter implants. And of course, we would always have a pilot. Okay, this is dying. Um, oh, no. 
right? We had one intermediate for the 375, two intermediates for the 42, and three intermediates. Now, the other one, the experimental group, was only the pilot plus the final. I thought it was uh, quite an interesting concept because we're not, in, you know, uh, incrementally increasing the diameter of the osteotomy and basically going from the pilot to a five millimeter final drill. Um, I don't recommend that doing, uh, doing that in uh, very narrow regions because you will lose control. Uh, I think I have placed over 20,000 devices and uh, of course in a flat bone like this model it was doable, but point of the matter was would jumping drills actually hurt us integration and in the end of the day it did not and in fact it actually yielded higher degrees of os integration over time then we primarily went into looking at a different actually uh, perspective into the same data which was to figure out what happens as a function of diameter out of this particular experiment. And interestingly enough, as you're seeing the trends over there for both BIC and BAFO, as you increase in diameter, basically your OS integration levels go down. And why would that be? Basically, you are, it, it's, it, it goes down to physics. Your speed is actually increasing as you increase in diameter. And also remember, we are irrigating that copiously. And once you do that, basically you're putting a fluid into the cavity and you're pushing that pretty hard outwards, right? And the harder you push outwards because of the increase in your diameter, basically you're pushing all of the things that we want around the implant to actually get it to heal. So have I actually quantified cellular mechanisms for this? Uh, no, will I? No, I think that this is pretty intuitive that these results are actually making sense. So another thing for us to actually observe, decreasing the speed, did that help any, even in classic or simplified instrumentation? Um, well, it didn't change anything at all. Now, when you change implant systems, of course you change the drill, you change the, basically the whole hardware aspect of things and we did instrumentation with 100, 500 and 1000 RPMs and every time that you increase your speed basically you may be actually getting in trouble. We've done this up to two and 3000 RPMs and I am not really proud of showing that data because it doesn't look good. Okay, so point of the matter being there's still a lot for us to be learned uh, when it comes to surgical instrumentation. The other thing comes about when one is discussing subtractive um, drilling, which it's all nice and fine. It does work. You may have to wait a little bit longer. Uh, but point of the matter is that a lot of authors have said that you have to remove the bone chips from your cavity. And I have always said, especially when we're dealing with orthopedic instrumentation, you want to leave as much as you can behind for a variety of reasons, um, especially for immunologic reasons and how that the bone healing cascade is actually going to take place. But the first time that we have seen bone chips within, let's say, healing chambers, which is you know, the bone area fraction occupancy region, was through uh, one of the interlock implants called the Blossom, which basically, as you are putting the implant in, that cutting edge, which is progressive from apical to cervical, basically puts those bone chips in there. And in the end of the day, were those detrimental to us integration? Not at all. They actually stayed right where they should have stayed and also they acted as nucleating sites for new bone formation. So everything that we have read and learned um, with respect to surgical instrumentation was pretty much textbook knowledge and there is still a lot for us to actually figure out on it. I am not going to go ahead, but I will. Uh, and tell you that irrigation uh, has been proven uh, by us to be quite a futile um, activity and procedure de depending on which bone you are and what you're trying to accomplish, depending on the surgical case, uh, not on the craniofacial area, but you know, below the neck. So, osteonosification studies conducted for 10 plus different dental implant systems. I am not going to name names, you know, we've done plenty of them and the results are all the same. This turns out to be quite a boring talk for me because the results are over and over and over and over absolutely identical regardless of the implant system that you're using, which in the end of the day will be 
intuitive for you because after I present the very first study to you, it is going to be more of the same and just validating and revalidating and challenging the models that we actually work on. So uh, the low density bone model, that's a ship hip. Um, I do not think I have ever drilled through lower density bone than a ship hip. Uh, we've done plenty of cervical and lumbar spine. Uh, the way I design studies um, actually turn out to be multifactorial. And by that, I mean that the study design are anti-fragile. If I have losses, I still have plenty of uh, statistical power based on how the study was designed because we tend to nest all of the experimental groups within the same subject, something that saves a lot of time. We have used the densification drills in both clockwise and counterclockwise. I want to make sure that you, you know, get from the onset that when you use the densification drill in the, counter, in the clockwise direction, it at first acts subtractively, but once the drill actually fills, it does condense, and that reflects beautifully in the histology that we had. And we always use the regular drilling, which is whatever the manufacturer recommends for low density bone. We've, we've done plenty of biomechanics, and the previous speaker has actually shown some of the biomechanical methods to use, so I'm not gonna bother explaining that. So, worked, uh, published by our group in the Journal of um, Mechanical Behavior Biomedical Materials. Very simple study, six sheep, average, you know, a large guy. Conic versus parallel walled implants, same manufacturer, moderately textured surface, so business as usual. Only six six in vivo, we've done three six and 12, which are underway for publication. And we have done the biomechanical testing insertion torque, which is an indicator, indicator of biomechanical primary stability. It is, how can I elegantly say this without upsetting a lot of people? Um, insertion torque is not an unequivocal, okay? It's not an unequivocal indicator of primary stability, is one of them. There are systems that you may have sky high insertion torque, but you don't have stability. This is something that we can discuss at some other time as well. And we've done, obviously, all the histology components as well. So pretty simple. Results for regular drilling, six weeks conic implant. Well, it did us integrate. You can tell that this bone is not the densest one. Basically, os integration as usual, some remodeling taking place because of osteocompression here. And now we move into the clockwise densa at six weeks. The one thing that I observe here is that even though this initially happens to be somewhat subtractive, I'm seeing autografting in some of the regions. Because of the drill design of the system, which goes through somewhere around here, Basically, you don't see much integration taking place at the low density bone, but as lowest density. But in the low density closer to the, let's say, crest of the hip, which doesn't uh, really exist, you do get densification even in, in clockwise direction. Now, moving into the counterclockwise direction, things change uh, substantially. Let's concentrate in this particular region here, you know, towards the cervical. You have a lot of autograft here. All right. And some of the questions that people have been asking me was, all right, you put all this autograft in there, what happens to it? And I was like, from a theoretical standpoint and from what we have generated uh, on our database over the past years, uh, there should be nothing for you to worry about. And we will investigate that too. So now, in an implant that is instrumented pretty much very close to its inner diameter, the regular drilling does show very nice os integration, and it should. Now, when you go into osteodensification in the clockwise um, direction, which is a mild osteodensification, when you see something darker around, basically, that happens to be autografting of your material, okay, of your bone. All right? So, higher magnification of these things here. What is the point that I'm trying to make? Well, you do get autografting regardless of in which direction you use the densifier. Less so for the clockwise, in plenty, as you can see here, for the counterclockwise. And people have worried whether this bone is going to go away, is it going to remodel, is it going to be a problem? Uh, it certainly is not a problem, as you can see, because there's bone around the bone chips that got trapped in there. 
um, basically bridging the chips, the surface, and the old bone. I don't see an issue with that. And what I'm seeing here, that is right here, a cutting cone that is actually showing that as early as in six weeks, things are already remodeling, so things will remodel. Very simple. The same thing, the very same features observed for the uh, parallel implant as well. So very consistent results across two different implant designs, two different surgical instrumentations. So, well, very simple. Conclusion, yes, it did work. So here we are. That's our cutting cone going through the autografted particle. So it does remodel. In fact, we have seen this happening as early as in three weeks. All right, same thing here, different bone design. Okay, we're right there, cutting cone, you know, already remodeling the bone chips that are actually there. Study number two. Now it gets fun, especially for the periodontists in the audience. Basically, same study design, uh, progressive power threaded implants, four by 10. Now, acid etched and as machined implants. You can imagine where this is going, right? Um, left side, we operated and uh, rendered samples that were three weeks in vivo, and the right side, six weeks in vivo. Uh, the same type of testing, biomechanics and histology. Now, when it comes to the insertion torque, regardless of whether you had acid etched or machined surfaced implants, uh, I think that's overt. Right? Even though I'm not the biggest fan of insertion torque to actually come up with an indicator or use it as an indicator of primary stability, that's kind of, um, you know, kind of unequivocal, right? So regardless of that, then we went through the very same exercise of looking at histology. At three weeks, this is um, an implant that was instrumented to this uh, particular distance somewhat. All right, implant is integrated in at three weeks. Very simple, nice interface. When you start using the densa burr in the clockwise direction, you already see a difference on how much bone, this is intramembranous actually healing, taking place at the chambers, which is kind of interesting as well. Moving forward. And as you can see, you already see plenty of dark spots within the, um, the healing chambers here, and you see a lot of bone integration at three weeks. This is interesting. Things are changing. What is the parameter that is being changed? Nothing but surgical instrumentation and the direction in which you're using the denser burr. Okay, right? Once again, plenty of autografted particles right there, somewhere here. So very easy to understand the concept. Basically, you densify and that densified wall actually happens to yield a nucleating surface for osteoblasts to go ahead and do their job. And in tandem, your osteoclasts are already remodeling your um, bone in order to reestablish homeostasis in there, okay? At six weeks, the regular drilling already beautifully osteointegrated. And let's go ahead and look what happens when you have osteodensification. Look at this guy right here, right there. Even in the clockwise direction, you do get densification, okay? And there's a reason for this, uh, which uh, we can discuss at another time. If you look at this, here is where my surgical, the outer diameter of the drill actually went through. And look at the wall that has been created here, right, of densification, right there. Plenty of particles that show as dark spots right there. Those are outer grafted particles. And what we're seeing is that these are there and they're rapidly remodeling. Now, when it comes to the metrics, people tend to like metrics more than uh, morphology. Surgical technique when it comes to bone or implant contact, very simple, both higher bone or implant contact. And when it comes to bone area fraction occupancy here as well, very simple, again, significantly higher. Point of the matter of this whole study uh, was that I didn't design it, I helped designing the study, but the idea actually came from Dr. Neva, who runs the Perio uh, post-grad program at uh, UF. And he wanted to see whether we were going to be able to increase the osteointegration level of as machined implants to the same level of um, moderately textured surface implants. And absolutely and unequivocally, that happened. So this and two other papers concerning different surfaces are actually moving very fast our publication and hopefully this is going to be out sooner than later. So yes, you change your instrumentation, you actually change how things heal, and you change the speed. 
and that validates some of the theories that I have put uh, forth a couple of years ago, uh, basically saying that what dictates healing happens to be the geometry and the surgical instru instrumentation and how those actually interplay with one another. Now, I think that this is the coolest one besides the other studies when we get pretty big uh, when it comes to the surgical site. We did regular, we did clockwise instrumentation and counterclockwise instrumentation to prove a point. We didn't put an implant in there. A lot of people were saying that if you create a wall, you're not gonna be able to allow for cell migration and that will preclude closing of your defect. Uh, six weeks in vivo, again. And that is our regular drilling. Uh, we certainly went through uh, both uh, cortical shells and what we're seeing here is nothing but intramembranous healing, which is what you would expect, in fact, based on you know, the bone that you're in, which is a low density bone, and the fact that we allowed for a bl uh, blood clot to be in there. Um, very, very nice intramembranous-like uh, ossification taking place right there. All right, so that is the subtracted drilling. Let's move into the densa clockwise. So what you're seeing here already happens to be the establishment of two healing walls right there. You see plenty of particles that are autographs like this one. What is this guy doing for us? Basically, as you can see on its surface, the lighter staining that you have there happens to be new bone. So nothing detrimental with actually having autografts in a wall after your osteotomy. Now this one, uh, you know, the counterclockwise intensifies a lot. And I don't know if you noticed, but the amount of bone that you have within this defect happens to be much higher than what we had with the regular drilling, the subtractive. We do have very, two very well-established walls in there, and we have a boatload of particles that are from autograft. And those are acting as nucleating agents. So in a very simple manner, and you're already educated, and, uh, or some of you who were already just revealed a lot of histology, when you see the dark spots, basically those are autographs, and those are serving and acting as nucleating agents, and that bone is already remodeling. So there's absolutely nothing wrong with densifying the site uh, plenty, especially as if you're dealing with a low density bone. So study number four. Uh, I remember this uh, going back. I have a, an extremely healthy relationship with Zimmer. Um, Zimmer has multiple times requested um, me to discuss with them some of the implant designs that they have. They asked me about the trabecular metal, and I thoroughly encouraged them to keep um, producing that particular implant because it allows for a different healing mode. I do not think that as of yet they have mastered as to where to put trabecular metal, but I think that that is the only implant besides a few other ones in the market that happens to allow a 100% intramembranous bone-like healing. Uh, and basically, the classic healing that we have, usually bone dies back first and it grows back in, at a speed of two to five micrometers a day. So if you die back 100 micrometers, in a best case scenario, it'll be 20 days before you close your gap. Intramembranous bone healing basically grows at 20 to 50 micrometers a day, and there's no dieback. And that has to do with how you actually design your system. So the idea was, uh, Zimmer was uh, keen on the idea of potentially using osteodensification to increase the primary stability of the trabecular metal implant, which Rightfully so, and very intuitively, given that you don't have all of the treads on it, of course you're gonna have lower degrees of insertion torque. Whether that translates into lower uh, ability of a material to actually have primary stability, I'm not quite sure, but that's exactly what we actually wanted to look into this particular study. I'm not gonna get into the implant distribution for this study. We did mechanics, we did a bunch of different um, param parameters in it. But to validate what I've just said, basically, when we compared the insertion torque of the trabecular metal versus the TSV, which is the regular implant, obviously, we would have higher degree of insertion torque for the TSV implant because, well, it has more treads. It is very simple to do that.
Now, when we looked into clockwise osteodensification, counterclockwise, and regular drilling, basically we have a negative trend. So like everything else that I've shown thus far today, basically uh, osteodensification does increase the insertion torque. And by the way, I used, I remember calling Zimmer from the OR in France and asked them, what drill should I use for the lowest density bone possible? And I used exactly that drill. So it was even under-instrumented, um, the, the site preparation in this particular case. Now, another parameter that would be nice to have and we do have in this particular study is, well, you have the insertion torque. And three weeks in, you go ahead, sacrifice a bunch of animals, and you can do the, re the reverse torque to see whether, you know, what the delta, what the variation between insertion torque and removal torque is going to be. And, well, to no surprise, this is the counterclockwise. This is the insertion torque right here. That is the removal. And they're basically statistically insignificant, whereas the insertion torque for clockwise and, in this case, the very underprepared site for the regular drilling all right, it goes in much weaker and then it does increase as us integration proceeds, all right? Very simple um, and simply put here, you know, it was very easy to understand that whenever you use the counterclockwise um, drilling, you do increase your insertion torque and not only that, we usually see a decrease in, um, in biomechanical um, fixation, and that doesn't happen whenever you use this type of instrumentation. Now, images are worth a uh, thousand words, so it is very simple. Just compare the one on the bottom for both sides when it comes to the regular to the one on the top, which is with the counterclockwise, right? Very, very overt relative to the one on the bottom. So we've ran 10 of these studies. These days I can run the study, I can already predict how the histology is going to look like. And the point of the matter of showing this, you this is the fact that you know, this is as consistent as it can possibly get in biomedical engineering, okay? Very, very consistent all around. Now, going into the metrics, right now, until now, in this particular study, we discussed the biomechanics and some of the morphology. Once again, you go to bone away implant contact, Regardless of densification direction, you get a higher bone to implant contact. Regardless of implant system as well as we see over here. Okay, so very, very simple. Now moving into uh, something that is a little more aggressive and adds a little more chaos in the, the structure. This is a manuscript that has been just accepted um, in the Journal of Mechanical Behavior and Biomedical Materials. We had 12 sheep, big guys, um, and we had only as machine four by 10 fixtures for cervical spine, regular versus counterclockwise because we do know that counterclockwise is going to work better than clockwise in most instances. Three and six weeks in vivo, and we did biomechanics insertion torque, and in this case, since, it's this, since this is actually a cervical spine, basically we did pull out. There is no point of doing torque in this particular case because the failure, the chief failure mode of surgical hardware for spinal fixation in the cervical and in the lumbar happens to be the pullout. The pullout for dentistry is not the smartest test, all right, but for orthopedics, it happens to be very, very uh, appropriate. Once again, insertion torque, you already know the result. I don't have to say anything. V stands for Versa, because one of the kids actually put that in there instead of putting osteodensification, all right. Uh, this slide actually shows our good friend Adam, who is a medical student who wants to do uh, neurosurgery, and, the, and thus he was involved in this particular project. All right, that's how we actually put the fixtures. We avoided uh, the vertebral arteries, the spinal cord, obviously, as well, and we did mechanical testing on this particular guy. And it is kind of, once again, overt. Here we are at about 120, 130 at best, and the pullout for us in this vacation, we're talking about 200 newtons. All right, that's 20 kilos to pull out a four by 10 fixture, which we didn't put all the way down because I didn't have advanced imaging 
in this particular uh, surgical setting and that particular OR, so I was afraid to hit the spinal cord because that's called game over when you do that. So once again, pull out strength, ossification all the way up. As you go zero to three to six weeks, of course you're seeing increase, but point of the matter being as early as zero weeks for the Versa, which is the day of surgery, you already have pull-out strengths that are comparable to the regular, what the regular would yield you at six weeks in vivo, all right? Once again, very simple, regular drilling on your left, counterclockwise drilling on your right, zero, three, and six weeks. Five seconds for us to actually look at that, and uh, I don't think that there's much to be looked at other than you know, the scenario on the right side is far different than the one on the left side. When it comes to the metrics, once again, let's not bother. At zero, three, and six weeks, you have higher degrees of bone to implant contact and bone area fraction occupancy in the spinal bone, cervical spine. Now, orthopods, I mean, the paper was accepted. It was not an issue, but some of the orthopods that were, and some of the neurosurgeons that were reviewing these papers, they were, this particular paper, they were uh, basically complaining that we didn't load those devices. And rightfully so, we did not. We were just testing the waters on a slightly denser bone to see what type of results we got. So now we're going through the pedicle of the lumbar vertebrae of a 65 kilo animal. Um, all right, six centimeters in length. All right, I needed to use an extender to actually drill those holes for acid densification. Uh, the regular was not drilling, it was actually manual um, instrumentation. And I do recall that day in the OR, um, the manual instrumentation for this times 12, and we did 12 of these surgeries in a day. I am, I usually leave the OR, I either go to the gym or to a bar, you know, depending on how the day actually went. This day I went to the bar because I had no need whatsoever to go to the gym, all right? So moving forward, we did three and six weeks in vivo, and we did biomechanics, pull out, at sacrifice, and, uh, and histologic as well. Now, for those who are not really understanding what you're looking at, this is L2, L3, L4, and L5, okay? The incision is about this big, this long. You know, each vertebra is about this tall, two inches tall. And point of the matter is that the orthopedic company wanted us to, cha to challenge the model. And you know, it's not unusual for us to go into the OR and you know, of course we have IACUC approval for everything and do allo transplantation, do you know, things that not everybody does. And this time was the very first time that I saw my chief vet scared of what we were doing. Um, not because of the surgery itself, because we basically eliminated the processes and we took the lamina out and exposed the spinal cord in there. So basically we destabilized the system to a point that he did not think that the animals would make uh, to the end point, which was uh, three and six weeks. And also the fact that these devices, they were actually not connected, so if you have two Okay, you lose leverage, right? So this is totally unstable. One side, I did the regular instrumentation, and on the other side, uh, osteodensification. Uh, just so you have an idea, I am pretty sure that if I had a crane in the OR, we would be able to lift a 65 kilo animal by holding it, putting a hook in one of these, given how strong these things actually were. Validated in the laboratory as well, subsequently. So. Point of the matter being, was it a, an aggressive enough model? Yes, it was, why? Because our pullout strength is actually going down as we go six and 12 weeks in, okay? So that is unstable, as unstable as it can possibly be. It is absolutely challenging how the surgical instrumentation and subsequent OS integration actually was taking place. In the mechanical testing, once again, when collapsed the data, OS intensification came out much higher, significantly higher. And at six weeks and at 12 weeks, the same happened, despite the fact that we were losing mechanical stability over time because of how overt 
aggressive the model actually happened to be. Nonetheless, significantly higher for the densification method uh, utilized. So, do I need to conclude anything here? I don't think so. I think that this is going to, you know, over time, over the next year, year and a half or so, be at both the dental, the craniofacial, the orthopedic, and the neurosurgery literature, hands down. The conclusions are basically the same for all the studies. And I just refuse after showing or downloading this amount of data on you uh, to actually draw any conclusions. So thank you for actually listening to um, a one-of-a-kind type of scientist that goes from you know, one era to another very quickly. Uh, I must acknowledge, I don't do this all alone. Uh, I have an army of 45 students that rotate in the lab, uh, a couple directors, uh, a lot of good collaborators, which happens to be the body and soul of the work. I always acknowledge the funding sources, and even though this was privately funded, remember that for you to run a successful enterprise, you must be in the multi-million dollar a year business, and that cannot happen and does not happen to the best of my knowledge unless you have NIH or DOD funding. And that provides you at least with the administrative hierarchy there so you can actually run your show better. And that's probably why we're probably one of the fastest labs in, around, right? And of course, uh, Versa for actually trusting uh, me and my colleagues and everybody that is involved in this for the work. I acknowledge uh, NYU Biomaterials, Plastic Surgery and Engineering uh, where I have, for I have um, appointments in these departments, and I, we actually work pretty hard in every single front in there. So I don't know whether we're entertaining any questions, but I'd like to in advance thank you very much for your attention.